Well, hi everyone, Ron Valent here. Uh, we have a bombshell information dump to give you uh, in regards to UNDRIP going forward in Canada. Uh, it's been very difficult to get people to wrap their brain around this, but now we have some good documentation that people can go and look at. And uh, I'll put the uh, link below uh, where you can go and look at the document. But um, UNDRIP, for those who don't know, is the United Nations Declarations on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And it's an absolute kill shot to anything that uh, any state that would implement it. Uh, Article 26 says that the Indigenous have the rights to the lands, territories, and resources to which they have traditionally owned, occupied, or otherwise used. Article 46 says that nothing in the Declaration may be inter interpreted as implying for any state people, group, or person any right to engage in any activity or to perform any act contrary to the Charter of the United Nations. And you have the federal government has in, in, uh, gone ahead and uh, passed uh, Bill C-15, which uh, says that all Canadian law has to be in alignment to, or consistent with UNDRIP. Uh, you have uh, BC, they went ahead in 2019 in October, adopted UNDRIP as a province, and now we're looking at Vancouver. And uh, this is really good in a sense that uh, it's a lot easier for people to wrap their brain around maybe a city and, and what's going on here. So, um, so what has happened now, the city of Vancouver's UNDRIP strategy has been released. It's a report of the UNDRIP task force to the City of Vancouver Mayor and Council. This is October 25, 2022. And we're just gonna kind of skip through some of these things here, some of the points that are brought into this whole thing. Uh, and this is on page seven, recommendations for Council's consideration. Whereas the Musqueam, Squamish, and uh, Salwatan people are the original stewards of the lands known as the City of Vancouver, okay? And um, <clears throat> it says here in the second paragraph, the city of Vancouver, known as the city, voted unanimously on June 24th, 2014. It's a long time ago to acknowledge that the city is on the unceded territory of the Moscow and Squamish and Telsa. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's hard for me to pronounce that. Uh, tells Watton peoples and the city adopted a reconciliation framework in 2018. So basically, Vancouver is uh, on someone else's land, is what they're saying. And um, in on page nine, second paragraph, it says that the, I'm just going to say the three bands to make it simpler on me. The three bands are the original stewards and rights and title holders of this land. So they're saying that they basically are the title holders of the land. Um, fundamental calls to action on page 11 um, talks about uh, in, in number one, it says identify and implement options for new rights based governments. So they're going to go uh, and change the governance model uh, to include uh, these three bands. Um, Number four says establish a process for the city to look for embedded colonialism within its systems and to reshape its own internal policies, uh, procedures and bylaws in ways which recognize and respect the laws and governance of the Moscowans, Squamish and Salwatan peoples. Okay, looking at uh, page 13, cultural uh, section. And uh, midway in the first uh, paragraph, it says a city is a colonial government which has played an active role in displacing indigenous peoples and imposing Western systems and values onto these lands and therefore has a responsibility to take action in remedying and accounting for these harms. Uh, and then it goes on talking about restoration of the original languages. Uh, so this is a, a big deal. Uh, they want to be able to pr prioritize access to cultural sites. Uh, going on page 15, the very last uh, paragraph, economic, the Indigenous rights and title includes rights to economic self-determination and wellness. So colonialization has severely impacted the economies and well-being of Indigenous peoples. 
I don't really understand how that works, but okay. So um, they've been excluded from benefiting and enjoying the abundance of their lands and resources, interfering with their rights to economic sovereignty. Uh, barriers to prosperity, such as restricted access to land and resources, um, impact each nation. UNDRIP Article 20.2 affirms that Indigenous peoples deprived of their means of subsistence and development are entitled to just and fair redress. The city has a responsibility to redress the losses experienced by the Musqueam, Squamish, and Salwati peoples. So with that, on page 16, they want to uh, identify ways to amplify and solidify meaningful uh, participation in building and sharing Vancouver's economic prosperity, including for economic partnerships, revenue sharing arrangements, ongoing funding agreements, redress agreements, allocation of property and other taxes to nations, and city fee and tax waivers. Um, to make the city an employer of choice for Indigenous workers, to ensure contract opportunities are reserved for business owned by and per partnered by the Moscowans, Squamish, and Selwat. Sorry I'm butchering that, but I'm trying my best here. Uh, also, this would include the, the first right of refusal for these bans for city land dispositions. Okay, now on, on page 17, we have, uh, it starts off with environmental racism. I didn't know there was such a thing. Environmental hazards disproportionately impact indigenous, indigenous communities. Oh, really? Uh, hazardous industrial projects and other disruptive impacts from colonialization and urbanization infringe on the ability of these bands to exercise their inherent constitutional and human rights. So they want to conduct a review of hazardous industrial projects from the lens of Indigenous rights, uh, co-develop and implement a policy, that's 2.3, uh, section 2.3, to assess the current and future industrial infrastructure development through the lens of Indigenous rights and title and environmental racism. Uh, to also 2-4 uh, section here to ensure that these bans are engaged in the city's environmental initiatives uh, to ensure that they address environmental racism, climate action strategy, healthy water plans, urban tree canopy, equitable green space address access, traffic and pollution exposure mitigation. Maybe you won't be able to drive in Vancouver not in a not too distant future. Uh, going down on the very last section of page 17, leasing, housing, and land. The colonial appropriation and occupation of the territories um, have directly unequivocally led to loss of land base, homes, housing, and community for Indigenous peoples. The unceded lands continue to be occupied, leased, and developed without the consent or involvement of Indigenous right holders. Policy and programs are needed for the bands uh, to ac access housing on their own lands and beyond res residential lands, reserve lands. So that's page 17. Page 19 talks about uh, reconciliation curricula sharing. Uh, and they want to be able to inform people about themselves Identify ways to ensure that uh, they are informed about leases and have input on what is occurring on the land. So they want to co-develop criteria for what types of lease renewals should be reviewed. Uh, and to co-develop a plan for city land transfers. They also want in section 213 to co-develop policies, programs, and processes to ensure that Indigenous people in Vancouver feel safe in accessing municipal services. <laughs> okay, on the very bottom of page 19, 217, it says to work and with and recommend that the Vancouver Police Department 
commit to integrating the articles of Undripped. Going on to page uh, 19 that continues on with that idea. Work with and recommend that the Vancouver Police Department address systemic and structural racism in ways that recognize and support and build upon Indigenous community initiatives. Uh, to include the bands and the diverse Indigenous populations living in the city in the development of the police board annual police business and strategy plans to ensure that the priorities are upholding UNDRIP. So they're going to get the police heavily involved in all of this. Okay, page uh, 21, revenue sharing. It says, over time, the city of Vancouver has generated enormous wealth from unceded lands and has expropriated lands and has not compensated the rights and title holders. Recognizing Vancouver as unceded Musqueam, Squamish, and Sal, Sal, what? But lands means addressing the inequities and loss created by land and resource disposition. There are domestic and international examples and precedents of revenue sharing arrangements between governments and indigenous peoples that can inform this work. So this is their, what they're talking about doing in uh, number section 3.1. Identify options for revenue sharing through property taxes. Example, by sharing a portion of existing new property taxes to uh, distribute to the various bands. 3.3 uh, three, three talks about to identify other options for revenue sharing, including but not limited to levies, fees, and taxes raised by the city. Funds should be distributed to these bands in a fair and equitable manner. You've heard about equitable. That's a UN buzzword. 3-4, to identify options for the bands to generate revenue. Prioritize training, employment for Indigenous people with developers, including establish guidelines for developers, including train and employ Indigenous peoples in their projects. On page 22, it talks in section 3-8, work with these bands to identify priority parcels of land which are culturally, economically, and socially significant to be repatriated with the end goal of having these lands given back. 3.9 talks about these bands having a say on leases signed by the city. Section 3.9 talks about uh, these bands having a say on the leases signed by the city. Um, 310 talks about ways for these bands to assert greater influence on city strategies, plans, and projects. Uh, going to page 24, it talks about, uh, in section 4.4, identify ways to support these bands to restore their indigenous laws within their own communities and across the city and weave them in more fully into local decision-making processes including each nation's own legal review of the city's projects and plans. They're going to have their hands in everything. Uh, page 25, uh, four, seven. Okay, uh, identify ways for these bands to practice their traditions on the land, including but not limited to. Co-develop mechanisms and, and agreements for co-management and transfer of uh, title of parks. On page 26, it talks about uh, establishment for, of institutions, and it says the city played a role for disrupting the original legal governance and educational system of the bands, and so the city has a role to play in supporting their restoration. So there'll be a whole big deal about that. Um, so on page 27, they talk about early actions. They want to uh, rename uh, various different assets uh, in regards to the various different bands. Uh, action three is build upon the social's uh, procurement framework and expand the procurement policy to prioritize Indigenous participation in all projects. Uh, early action five would be to uh, develop the process and requirements for event organizers to engage and partner with the MST. Early action six, provide a spectrum of mandatory anti-racism and in 
indigenous cultural safety training for employees. Uh, there's going to be a bunch of anti-racism training because when people really find out what's really going on and, and this whole uh, big uh, land grab and the implications of it all, people are going to be pretty upset. And, uh, and this is not going to be good. Uh, the UN is using the indigenous to forward their agenda 2030 and to make it so that uh, we'll be happy uh, and own nothing. And so people are going to get very upset about this. And the indigenous need to realize that they're being used as pawns. And it's not going to go well for anyone here. Uh, on page 28, it says the UN Declarations on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is a framework of minimum standards. And if you read the, uh, the Indigenous Rights of Peoples that they put forward there, it gives them tremendous rights, exclusive rights that no one else will have. And uh, that is so far over the top. And for them to say now it's minimum standards, there's going to be no end to all of this. Okay, so yeah, so that's kind of just glancing through this whole thing. It's not very good. But um, people need to realize that uh, this is going on. It's not just, uh, you know, a horror movie script that uh, you can walk away from and it goes away. This is really happening and this is going to happen. This is Vancouver right now. But it's going to happen in every city and town and area in Canada. And for those who are listening abroad, the U.S. and uh, other countries in Europe and whatnot, it's, this is global. It's all going on behind the scenes as it's been going on behind the scenes for years here. Only it's been revealed by whistleblowers like myself and others who uh, are letting people know about it because the politicians, the uh, mainstream media, um, are all very quiet about it as to identifying really the, the true implications of all of this. And, and it's only going to be fully revealed when basically you get a letter in the mail saying that you're on someone else's land and that you need to start paying fees or you need to get off the land. And uh, yeah, so anyhow, you need to share this out. Uh, we'll uh, probably do an update in the future on this, but uh, for right now, this is it, and it's happening, and it's right in real time. All right. Uh, take care and uh, download the documents and uh, start sharing with others. Bye.